Okay, it is 2.45. Welcome back everyone to our workshop on using Earth Observation for water quality monitoring. We are now ready to start session two, which is going to start look by looking at marine applications for Earth Observation data. I'm going to hand over to Lauren Beerman from the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, who's going to give us a first talk about using Earth Observation to detecting plastics. So welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Lauren Beerman and I'm an optical a remote, marine remote sensing scientist based at Plymouth Marine Laboratories. And I'm going to take you through um, the last sort of two years of work on that we've been doing at PML, uh, detecting floating macroplastics using high resolution optical satellite data, and also tell you a little bit more about the next two years of work that we are planning to do. But I'm going to start with the doom and gloom and then get it out the way. Um, so recent stats from the Tier Fund organization um, have shown that across just six countries, four companies, Coca-Cola, Nestle, PepsiCo and Unilever, create enough plastic pollution to cover 83 football pitches every single day. Um, and what's interesting about these stats is that they don't take into account contributions from North America or Europe, but in fact, these are big uh, global producers of plastics. So that number of 83 football pitches every day is actually an underestimation of um, plastic pollution produced. Um, the, the statistics are staggering. 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic have, have been produced since the 50s and over all time, less than 10% of all of those plastics ever produced have ever been recycled. Um, and that's a hard fact, but it's because actually making plastics uh, de novo from the raw material, which is, um, you know, fossil fuels, oil, gas and coal, is cheaper than trying to recover it through recycling, which is inefficient and expensive. And if I could highly recommend this NPR report um, titled How Big Oil Misled the Public into Believing Plastic Would Be Recycled. And I know you're thinking, what? Big oil misleading the public? <laughs> yes, uh, that has in fact been their, um, their, uh, their thing again. Um, what they've done is they've really pushed the recycling message, even though they know that it is uh, inefficient and um, not going to be taken. And a lot of the positive recycling messages that have been put out there um, that you may have heard before have been bankrolled by companies like Exxon and Chevron. So it is worth being aware of the fact that plastic production is going to continue um, and increase. And we know that um, recycling is not going to get us out of this problem. So we can accept that a fair proportion of those plastics are going to enter our oceans every year. So that's a, that's a big motivation, um, an incentive for us to start to use different types of data to monitor this problem on synoptic scales, try to answer questions about trends and faiths, um, of plastics in the marine environment. Now, satellite data have not yet widely been used for the detection of macroplastics in the marine environment, and these reasons are quite solid. Um, and it's mainly to do with the lack of access to freely available high-resolution optical data. This has been this has changed uh, thanks to the Copernicus program and the European Commission. Um, through the European Space Agency operated Sentinel 2A and B satellites, which were launched in 2015 and 2017, respectively. Um, you've already heard today that these were mainly terrestrial services developed, um, but coverage does include coastal waters every two to five days at 10 meter resolution. So we're limited by all the normal things optical satellite uh, scientists are limited by, like cloud and surface features like wave caps. But more specifically, we're also, for this work, reliant on the presence of submesoscale features. And I think this video demonstrates that quite nicely. We have um, material gathered um, into a patch along a front. And if we, you know, we know that there's plant material mixed with plastic there. And if this is about the size of a Sentinel-2 pixel, and within this, we have water, plant material, and plastics. So in order to understand the contributions of each, we use the, the, the bands available to us on, on Sentinel-2. So again, you heard earlier today um, that commercial higher resolution satellites sometimes only offer four bands. Well, we use a fair number of the bands offered by Sentinel-2 and we specifically leverage most of these around the near infrared because water absorbs very efficiently in, in the near infrared, but things floating on water are going to reflect 
So we use something that, your ter that you terrestrial scientists might know quite well. We use the NDVI, and we also use a floating debris index that was developed at PML. We access level 1C Sentinel-2 data um, through the hub, and we process it using an atmospheric correction called Acolyte. Uh, this conserves the near infrared to shortwave infrared wavelengths, which is what we need to be able to leverage those, those bands for detection. We then, um, you know, I'm sure quite well the NDBI, but the floating debris index is based on a floating algae index, and you don't need to know any any more than that, except to say we leverage the heck out of the near infrared, and it's excellent for subpixel detection. And what I mean by subpixel detection, if you'll um, if you'll read from right to left across the screen, sorry about that. Um, the University of the Aegean, their marine remote sensing group deployed um, some target some plastic targets over the last few years. On the right-hand side, you see an RGB image collected by a drone. In the middle, you see the equivalent from Sentinel-2, and I've, I've really um, artificially enhanced that. I've brightened it, and in the red box where you should see those targets, you barely see anything. But if you apply the floating debris index on the left-hand side, you can see it, it lights up like a Christmas tree. Um, it, it manages to pick up those targets on subpixel scales because they don't fill, even though they're 10 by 10 pixels, they didn't end up filling the, the pixels perfectly. This study was also excellent at showing us that not all pixels, not all plastics are created equal. Plastic bottles are far more easy to detect, and so you only need about 30% of a pixel filled with plastic bottles before you can detect it. Fishing nets, you need upwards of 55%, and plastic bags are the same. Um, so even though there are 12 possible pixels here, we only end up ended up being able to use three. And um, this fourth one over here, where you see I've grayed out the X, we actually didn't end up using because of the interference from the bottom reflectance. So we managed to get three perfect pixels from this deployment. Um, and thanks to multiple deployments led by the Marine Remote Sensing Group, we were able to get nine perfect pixels of plastic um, in total. And from that, we were able to build a spectral signature of what plastic looks like. And then we compared it to all other things we thought uh, would be floating in the marine environment, things like seaweed and driftwood, um, and we even looked at the water itself. Um, and we saw that the spectral signature of plastic was unique enough when compared against other marine debris to, to perhaps be used for automated identification, because the manual process is incredibly time consuming. But let me tell you, it doesn't matter how forgiving an automation process is, especially if you go towards machine learning, you're not going to be able to train anything using nine pixels of plastic. So the first thing we had to do was get at least as many pixels as we had of the other materials in the marine environment. So we went with validated plastics that were collected off KwaZulu-Natal after severe flooding in April 2019. We had plastics, um, I mean, an extraordinary amount of plastics you can see that were in the water and washed up on the beaches. Um, and thanks to um, some, some communication with Grant Blakeway, who you can see in this picture over here, he told us when the plastics were in the harbor and when they were washed out. And in a small gap between clouds, we were able to detect well over 50 pixels. Of, of these validated ocean plastics. We then looked at all of the debris that we had in the marine environment, and we used this as a training library for a machine learning approach, um, and we chose the naive Bayes classification approach. Um, and using all uh, those validated data sets, uh, we, then, we then went for a machine learning automated classification. Um, we like this machine learning approach um, because it's quite an elegant and easy one to replicate, but also it requires a small number of samples. Um, and all that it relies on in terms of assumptions is that predictors are independent. Um, for, so we fed it a values of the FDVI, the NDVI, and several of the bands from Sentinel-2. And it then computed the probability of a pixel that we fed it from the wild to belonging to one that matched um, the a pixel from that it was trained with. So when I say in the wild, I mean um, places where we had read in the literature or on social media about plastic being in the water. And we went and found um, quite, quite a fair amount of examples. And the ones in red are the ones that made it into our paper that was published just a few months ago. Um, I'm going to only go through one of those examples because it's close to home. Uh, it's the east coast of Scotland. Um, here, this photo that was kindly shared with us by um, an old colleague of mine from the Sea Mammal Research Unit at the University of St Andrews. He's shown a seal pump, a seal pup that's hauled out, um, and you can see that it's 
it's falling outside is just covered in plastic debris. Um, and it's not that Scottish people are litterbugs. Um, indeed, uh, a, a recent study by Stanov et al. has shown extreme westward surface drift in the North Sea. And so plastic bottles washing up on the east coast of England or Scotland may indeed have come as far from, as far from the Elba River that was spoken about earlier this morning. And, and, and indeed, uh, in this black area over here, um, this is where we ended up finding plastic debris. This is the Isle of May, just outside the Firth of Forth in Scotland. This is a very enhanced Sentinel-2 image. Uh, you can see this natural front, it's quite strong. Um, this is a very rare cloud-free and wind-free day in Scotland. Um, but thanks to that, the floating debris uh, really lighted up when we applied, it, applied the floating debris index. Uh, you can see there's some debris over here. This was uh, seaweed. And these aggregations over here were a mix of seaweed foam and, in, and also plastic debris. Um, across all sites, uh, with different sort of um, accuracy, the pixels that we manually detected using spectral shape were then classified or confirmed as plastics by the classifier, the naive Bayes model, with an accuracy overall of 86%, but that varied. So in Canada, we had 100%, um, and all of the way in Vietnam, we had 77%, so that was the lowest we got. And I think in Canada, we had such good results because we were looking mostly at polystyrenes in, in a harbour. Um, and in Vietnam, I think it was lower because of the high background turbidity of the water. Um, but, it, but you know, even so, this number over here has already been improved by, um, by increasing the library that we have. I think mainly what we demonstrated through the study was that, okay, plastic has a relatively distinct spectral signature, the FDI is good for subpixel scales, and you can use machine learning to classify. But actually what I think we really demonstrated is how tricky this work is. It's a needle in a haystack exercise a lot of the time. And then there are contributing confounding factors like uh, atmospheric correction, adjacency effect, and the impact of high turbidity. But we're addressing this um, in many ways over the next two years. So one of the ways we're doing this is ESA have uh, generously funded a few projects of ours. I'm going to go through two of them. One of them is called Plastic Plants. We're working in the Saigon River. I'm working with my colleague, Tim Van Emmerich from the University of Wageningen. And we're, we're looking at hyacinth as um, an aggregator of, of plastics. And um, early results have shown that upwards of 70% of river plastics can be transported in these hyacinth patches. And these patches are easily detectable by Sentinel-2. This over here is um, a sampling net. You can see it's been deployed up a bridge. And this is about a meter across. So you can see how nicely this would fill a pixel. And um, what is left to do is machine learning classification because the current one doesn't know what to do with water, this turbid or plants, this photosynthetically active. So we're starting with a new machine learning classification library. The other project that we're doing is outside the Elba River. This is quite fun. We, we're working with Skyflox on this. It's an ESA-funded project. We've got, a, we've got a seaplane and we've put a bunch of toys on it, a GoPro and some multi-spectral cameras, the Maya and the MicroSense, and we might even get a hyperspectral camera on there. Um, and we're looking at extending the library of all floating materials in coastal waters, including um, the water types, because this is such a tidal and turbid area. It's so variable. And I think we'll get a lot of good data out of that. And the idea is, uh, that we could perhaps instrument commercial flights in the future to collect that data for us on a more routine basis. Um, we're also working on the atmospheric correction. We're, we're trying a data-driven alternative to atmospheric correction here. It's called PanFed. It's still in the early stages. Um, ben O'Driscoll um, from the University of Plymouth has been helping us um, by testing that, and some of this work will now be funded by NEADAS. Um, but the idea is to put this into an automated process processing chain from start to finish, uh, from detection all of the way to classification with the atmospheric correction uh, applied in between. Um, so that's what we're working on at the moment, because this will become increasingly important for work that we're hoping to do in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch in the North Pacific Gyre. We're supporting Mary Crowley, who runs Ocean Voyages Institute. This year, she managed to remove over 100 tons of derelict fishing gear in the form of ghost nets. And next year, she's committed to removing a million pounds of plastic. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing that she does. They go out there in their vessels and they just sort of zigzag around looking for derelict fishing gear. And we're hoping that by um, getting the European Space Agency to extend data collection over key areas of, this, of the North Pacific Gyre, we'll be able to direct those efforts. 
Um, but towards that, we need a new approach to atmospheric correction as well. So that's me, Dan. I just want to say that it takes a village to tackle something as complicated as this. And I get to work with some brilliant people who've been progressing this research. Um, but I also just want to say thank you to you for listening and to Jane CC for hosting me today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lauren. That was really interesting and I think it's exciting to see where this could take us in future. Um, so thank you, that was brilliant. We're now going to pass on to Andre Kurukin, also from Plymouth Marine Laboratory, who is going to tell us about oil spill detection using radar satellite imagery. So welcome, Andre. Okay, my presentation is about uh, monitoring oil spills in the ocean. Uh, using radar remote sensing data and um, oil spills are um, quite devastating for marine environment uh, because of uh, their first of all toxic effect and they directly affect uh, the environment birds mammals fish and shellfish they also contaminate beaches uh, marshlands and grasslands um, where the birds hatch and also they may damage um, basic environment and ecosystem for quite a long period of time for decades so that's why it's quite a big problem oil spills and this slide just shows you a map um, which uh, has some dots, uh, blue and red ones, uh, showing oil spill accidents with tankers. The blue dots for uh, accidents less than 700 tons of oil leakage, and red, one, red ones for more than 700 tons. So, as you can see, the geography of oil spill accident is quite wide, worldwide, and it's a kind of global problem. And uh, of course, oil tankers and oil productions are main sources of oil spills. And there are other, other sources like located on the coast, like refinery factories and oil pipelines, or there are some areas where we have natural oil seeps, uh, which are source of oil on the sea surface. And looking at uh, <clears throat> transportation of oil, we can see that uh, the amount of oil transpo transported over seas is growing during the latest decades, but uh, improvements in the technology uh, resulted in reduction of the number of oil spill accidents. Nevertheless, we still have some big oil spill events and accidents with tankers. Um, the plot on in the bottom of the slide just shows uh, well-known accidents and the amount of oil released into water. The most recent one is uh, Sanchez tanker accident in 2018. So from this data, we can see that oil spills is quite a big problem, still a big problem. And at PML, we were working on developing a methodology and a service for monitoring oil spills using satellite data in particular using by using synthetic aperture radar sensors. Uh, there are several reasons why SAR sensors are suitable for oil spill detection. First of all, these are active sensors so that they can operate at day at night and um, they use microwaves that can easily penetrate through clouds, fog and precipitation providing um, data on regular basis. Our service is focused on using freely available Sentinel-1 SAR sensor data provided by the European Space Agency. And uh, that's why the service is quite 
suitable for the developing countries because um, uh, the service uh, is not very expensive. Sentinel-1 sensors uh, that we use are Sentinel-1A and B that provide 12-day revision frequency for each sensors. Uh, they operate in C-band using HH, VV and cross polarizations. Um, resolution of uh, the sensor data is up to 5 by 5 meters and 400 kilometers worth. So they can observe quite large areas. And uh, all spills produce very thin layer on the sea surface, which uh, dumps sea waves generated by wind. And radar sensors are very sensitive to these sea waves and changes in sea roughness on the sea surface so that oil spills are quite clearly visible in uh, radar satellite images as dark spots so they can be detected in these images and reported to end users and these slides in the middle left shows um, an example of uh, Sentinel-1 synthetic aperture radar image of the Malacca Strait where you can see these uh, dark bands following uh, the ship and most likely these are oil spills uh, produced by uh, pumping um, well bilge waters from the ship. Another example is on the right side uh, oil spills produced by oil rigs in the Gulf of Guinea and uh, yet another example in the middle right also some oil spills produced by oil rigs so all this um, just demonstrate uh, the usefulness of Sentinel-1 synthetic aperture radar data for oil spill monitoring and our system is based on automatic approach when we download satellite data, process this data and use machine learning technique to discriminate between oil spills and lookalikes. That can be also dark spots but not oil spills like natural films on the sea surface or, or algal blooms. They can also form some films on the sea surface and dump waves. But uh, by analyze, analyzing their shapes, we can discriminate oil spills from lookalikes. <clears throat> and this is a processing chain we use for our service, which includes preliminary processing of satellite data, including calibration, mapping, and <clears throat> masking land from water. Also, we detect dark spots and apply <clears throat> classification technique to discriminate oil spill from lookalikes. Um, our machine learning technique uses training data set that we developed and collected at PML to train classifier. And this data set includes more than 700 um, examples of oil spills in Sentinel-1 images. I would like to show you uh, an example of applying the service for the oil spill accident in Senegal in July 2020 when um, some oil from the broken pipeline at uh, the refinery plant has leaked into the sea and we could easily detect these oil spills in this region. The one which is shown by this red arrow leads to the refinery plant at the coast. Um, the detected uh, oil spills are shown on this map. They cl clearly illustrate the location of the source of oil leak and uh, extent of oil spill. This is another example of applying our service to the Mauritius oil spill accident in July 2020 when oil tanker Vakashio hit the coral reef and uh, 4,000 tons of fuel oil leaked into the water. We could detect these oil spills uh, with our service 
you can see this red outline of oil spills in the satellite image shown on the slide. And this is a map of uh, detected oil spills. We are working on extending our developed service to new areas, including uh, the West African coast. And we have got an excellent coverage of uh, this area by Sentinel-1 sensors. We also work on extending our database of uh, oil spill and lookalike examples to improve uh, accuracy of uh, classification. We also plan to integrate uh, the oil spill detection data with AIS and uh, satellite vessel location data to link oil spill data and uh, vessel locations. And we are experimenting, experimenting with uh, using deep learning neural network techniques to improve classification of oil spills and lookalikes. Um, that concludes my presentation. Any questions? Thank you very much, Andre. That was uh, fascinating and really nice to see your, your future um, areas of work there as well. We're going to move on now to hear from Mikhail Vasquez from IFRIMA to tell us about using Earth observation products in seabed habitat mapping. Okay, so um, thank you, Emily and uh, Paola, for inviting the project Simulate Seabed Habitat for this uh, talk. So I'm uh, Mikhail Vasquez. Uh, I work at IFRIMA from France. Uh, compared to what is in the program, uh, I've narrowed a bit uh, the scope of the presentation. Uh, I will, um, I will present uh, the use of Earth observation products in seabed habitat mapping, but it will be limited to uh, products on light, and it will be also limited to uh, what we do uh, within the framework of the project Immunet Seabed Habitat. Uh, so I will uh, briefly present the, uh, the project, then I will uh, present why and how uh, we use uh, Earth observation data on light in uh, in one of our products, which is EUC map. Then uh, I will uh, uh, broaden a bit and uh, mention how Earth observation products are used in another approach to seabed habitat mapping, which is seabed distribution modeling. And I will conclude. So today I'm representing uh, the project Immodet Seabed Habitat, which is a consortium of 11 partners that cover all European sea basins. The, the project is coordinated by IFREMER and the technical coordination is done by the GNCC. Imonet Seabed Habitat is one of the seven thematic lots of Imonet, which are human activities, bathymetry, geology, biology, chemistry, physics, and seabed habitats. Each thematic lot uh, aims at um, making freely available uh, marine observation data and metadata uh, through uh, web portals and web services. And a second mission of, uh, Imo, of the thematic lots is to make data products. And in, in Imonet, by data product is meant uh, uh, data sets that are uh, constructed with other data sets. In Imonet Seabed Habitats, uh, our flagship product is um, the Broad Scale Seabed Habitat Map, uh, also known as EUC Map. It is a map of the spatial distribution of broad habitat types. We've been working on that product for, for more than 10 years now. We, we started with, uh, um, uh, with pilot areas and progressively we uh, extended the, uh, the spatial coverage and now it covers all the European waters. Um, Christine uh, mentioned uh, in her presentation UK CMAP. Well, EU CMAP is the same as UK CMAP, but it's, uh, it's for this, the, the entire Europe. So basically, what I'm going to say uh, here is, uh, is true. It's also true for for, EU, uh, for UK CMAP. Um, so why and how uh, data is used? Uh, light data is used in EU CMAP. Well, first of all, what is a habitat? Um, a habitat is a set of, of uh, physical characteristics in which uh, species or a group of species um, feel happy and uh, uh, are, are able to live. 
there are uh, tons of habitat classification in the world, and there is one that uh, is quite used in Europe, which is the classification UNIS, and uh, that's the classification that we use in uh, for EU CMAP. So UNIS uh, describes habitats uh, with a type of substrate, sand, mud, rock, etc., a type of uh, hydrodynamic energy, high, moderate, low energy, and a type of biological zone, inflatoral, secretoral, etc. So here you have an example of uh, UNIS habitat, high energy inflatoral rock. So in this habitat, the seabed substrate is rock, the biological zone is inflatoral, and the, um, uh, the hydro hydrodynamic energy regime is high energy. So if you have a map on seabed substrate, another one on hydrodynamic energy, and another one on biological zone, then um, you are able to construct a, a, a map of seabed habitats in the UNIS classification. So the map on the seabed substrate is provided by Imonet Geology, so we don't have to do anything there. But for hydrodynamic energy and biological zone, we have to do everything from scratch. Um, so from now, now on, I will, uh, I will uh, only talk about uh, biological zone because this is where um, data products on uh, light uh, is used is used for. So here are these uh, biological zones from the coast to uh, very deep seas. There is the infrared then the circulatory, deep circulatory, bathyol, and abyssal. The lower limit of the infrared is uh, where uh, photophilic algae uh, or seagrasses disappear because there is no sufficient light anymore for, for them to grow. Photophilic algae means uh, algae which lacks uh, light. Uh, the lower limit of the circulatory is where the hydrodynamic hydrodynamics becomes stable. And uh, the other two limits, the limits the limit between the deep, sec deep circulatory and the basiole and the limit between the basiole uh, and abyssole are uh, drastic slopes and changes. So for, for these two limits, if you want to map these two limits, you need especially explicit data on depth. For mapping this, this limit, you need especially explicit data on uh, water movement induced energy. And for mapping this uh, limit, you need specially explicit data on light available at the seabed. And this is where uh, Earth observation products on light comes come into play. So as part of Imolet Seabed Habitat, we have developed uh, a data set on the photosynthetically uh, active radi radiation, the PAR. We have developed another data set on the diffuse attenuation coefficient of the PAR. Uh, which is named the KD bar. Uh, we have here uh, a data set on bathymetry. And by uh, combining this, this three data set uh, using this uh, equation here, uh, we, uh, we obtain uh, a data set on uh, the PAR at the seabed. Here are the, specific, uh, the um, uh, technical specification of uh, each data set. So the, bath the bathymetry is provided by Imonet bathymetry at the resolution of 100 meter. Well, um, uh, the PAR and the KD PAR were derived from uh, Murray's uh, instrument. They are average values over five years, 2005 uh, to 2009. Uh, why this period? Well, uh, because we started the project in 2009. That's uh, as simple as that. Um, the, the PAR has a, a resolution of four kilometers and the KD PAR has a resolution of 250 meters. If you'd like to know how the KD PAR uh, is estimated from the Murray's archives, uh, there is uh, this paper from uh, Solkin et al. Um, we don't have any specialists of, of, uh, of, of, of observation uh, products in the uh, Imolet Seabed Habitat, so uh, we, uh, we have subcontracted uh, everything to ACRI, which is uh, a French company, and Bertrand Solquin is the one at ACRI who developed the algorithms to process the, the data. So once we have uh, our layer or our map of PAR at the seabed, 
uh, we um, classify it in infrared soil and below infrared soil using this threshold 0.7. Well, I don't have time to uh, uh, to explain how this uh, threshold is uh, is uh, worked out, but um, please believe me, it doesn't uh, come out of the blue. Uh, so this was for EUC map. Um, I would like to uh, roll a little bit and uh, mention now uh, another approach that uses EU product, EU, uh, EU product which is um, species uh, distribution modeling (SDM). This is an approach that is quite quite used now in the world for uh, to uh, to make. Um, maps of special of the special distribution of uh, some species. The principle is to use um, data sets on the, these environmental variables that explain the, uh, the the occurrence of a species by fitting a statistic, statistical model. There are a lot of uh, approach uh, te techniques: GLM, GAM, random forest, etc. And uh, by using this, uh, and then this uh, statistical uh, model is used to uh, to make uh, a predictive map of the spatial uh, distribution of the species. You have here an example of uh, uh, Zostera marina, which is a, uh, a species of seagrass that grows in uh, temperate waters. The uh, environmental variables are uh, that explain the the presence of the of the species is a uh, is light, wave, and uh, temperature, um, and then a statistical model is uh, is fitted and uh, applied to um, uh, make a, a map of the space, uh, the the presence uh, probability of the Zostera marina. There are three seabed habitat forming species that require light uh, to grow. Uh, kelp species uh, that, that form uh, kelp forest, seagrass species that form seagrass meadows, and coral species that form coral reefs. These habitats host uh, a lot of biodi biodiversity, so it's quite important to protect them and uh, know their, spe their special distribution and uh, special coverage. And uh, SDMs are, are, are a good way to provide uh, uh, this knowledge, this knowledge at uh, an uh, affordable cost. Time for conclusion now. So uh, I hope that uh, I'm con I've uh, convinced you that light is a key, key driver to uh, many coastal seabed habitats special distribution. So it's very important for habitat modelers to, to have a reliable uh, full coverage, special explicit data at a good resolution uh, over extensive areas. Uh, Earth observation is today the sole approach able to provide such data. Um, for habitat model modelers to make better models, uh, desirable improvement would be in the, in the resolution, ideally 50 meters. Uh, but um, I've um, um, Name uh, Karsten. Yeah, Karsten mentions uh, 100 meter, which uh, which is fine too. Um, and uh, desirable improvement would be also in the provision of un uncertainty uh, for each pixel. Uh, this information is rarely uh, provided by data providers, and it's a bit um, it's a bit complicated for us because without that information, uh, we are not able to. Um, uh, to assess the uh, the confidence the confidence in our in our maps, so uh, we'd be happy to have uh, this uh, information as well as uh, the uh, uh, as well as well as the EU um, uh, yeah as well as as the, as the product. So thank you very much.
thank you, Mikhail. That was um, fantastic, really useful products there and some fascinating applications. The SDMs, I just think, are, are really, really interesting. Um, so thank you. That was brilliant. And thank you very much to our other speakers in this first section. We're now going to take questions again from the audience. Um, and if any other speakers or experts in the audience, again, would like to comment or add anything, then please let us know with the chat function or go to meeting and we'll try and bring you in. So, Paula, what questions do we have? Okay, thanks, Emily. Yeah, we've had quite a few um, questions coming in. Um, I don't know whether um, Lauren and Andrea Mikhail would all like to put their webcams on, if you want, um, that we can see you answering the questions. Um, you don't have to, but the option is yours. Yep, hello, Lauren. Nice to see you. Hi, Mikhail. Hi. Um, just to give me something to say while I'm finding way through these questions. All right, our top question of the list is um, for Lauren. Um, in addition to the um, the indices, so their reflectance, um, does the classification take the shape of plastic debris into account? Um, no, there's very little that we can get aside from unmixing a pixel on um, uh, dominance from a particular type of material. So shape so far has not seemed to play too much of a role and we don't have enough in-situ validated data to tell if that's actually contributing to our signal or not. So I guess the question is, watch this space, or is the answer, really? It did sound like an area of research with a lot of future avenues. It does sound very exciting. So I'll come back to you for some quite a few other questions we've got for you. I hope we can get through them all. Um, so to um, move on to Andre now. Um, are there plans to use this method you described of detecting oil spills um, for legal enforcement purposes um, to discourage ships from releasing oil in their bilge water, for example? Um, and I guess, you know, could you link that with AIS data? Yes, yes. Uh, it's in our plans to extend our service uh, by using AIS data, or we can directly see the locations of vessels in the SAR images. But um, of course, just looking at the images, you cannot say that this vessel is uh, responsible for pollution. But um, this information can be useful for uh, checking some limited number of vessels in the neighborhood of the oil spill. Because there's another interesting um, area of work we're using Sentinel-1 data to detect the actual vessels themselves and then link that to AIS data. Um, do these projects overlap at all? So we use Sentinel-1 to detect the vessel and then use Sentinel-1 to detect the spill and put the two together? Yes, yes, we do this, but uh, just didn't have enough time to <laughs> cover okay. everything. Yeah, that's another really interesting project. Thank you. Um, right, I'm just because I know there is a question um, that came up during the um, the opening talk by Christine because um, she spoke about you um, so UK CMAP which as you said Mikhail is um, the same method as EU CMAP and the question was what type of VO data was used could you share with us the techniques and what was the software used so quite a lot of questions and I know you've told us that it was um, Eris data and you did point us towards that paper published in I think 2012 that the work was done by ACRI and um, yes. is there anything else that you'd like to um, to add to that do you have any details about um, uh, software or, or you know, how, how can people can people process data like this themselves Oh, not really, because uh, as I said, uh, we um, totally sub subcontract this to uh, to agree. So um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So the best thing would be to um, to have a look at the the, pa the 2012 paper that you published. Yes, uh, yes. Sorry, that you put in your slides. Um, and yeah, just a reminder to people um, that all the slides from the presenters will be made available um, after the workshop. So there's quite a lot of information to take in here. So you will be able to go to that paper and others to get that kind of information. Okay. Um, right, coming back on to plastics, um, Lauren, what is the smallest detectable size of marine plastic able to be identified with Sentinel-2? So obviously you can go smaller than a pixel. Um. Yeah, so I, again, that depends on the type of plastic. So we've seen that water bottles, for example, are highly reflective and much easier to see. So if we imagine a single piece of plastic um, like polystyrene, like a big piece of polystyrene, I reckon would only need to fill um, a maximum of 30% of a pixel, which is about 30 by uh, three by three meters. 
Um, so that's still quite big. Um, but actually within these aggregations, we tend to find that lots of material sticks together. So filling a pixel is not as tricky. Okay. Um, and that was interesting because that reminded me of a question I thought of and it didn't write down, but the um, the water, the, the bottles are easier to detect than some of the other things like fishing nets and plastic bags. Um, do you know what, is it maybe because they've got air trapped inside them? Is it something like that? So, yeah, I think something like that. So also um, what I should have mentioned, and I see there is a question about it, that the minute you have even the plastic even slightly below the water, um, it's going to be much harder to detect. And I think that's got a lot to do with it. So the big derelict fishing ghost nets that we find, and they tend to, the ones that we spot tend to be the ones that still have buoys attached. Even if they're covered in biofilms, those polystyrene buoys tend to actually be the bits that we detect with the, with the biggest ease. Uh, so I think it's about surface profile and, and, and how white and bright they are. As someone else asked about color, color does play a role. Um, and so, you know, within the visible range, so it's also something that we're learning um, because I disregarded color in the beginning, but hyperspectral sensor and studies are showing that I maybe need to be a bit more cautious about checking that out. So I suppose if, if colour is an issue, then as you say, things being covered over by bio bioaccumulations on top of them could also then affect that and mask their colour. I think you, you've tackled two or three questions in that go. Um, just because we mentioned um, plastics in the water column versus at the surface, um, the person who asked that question did actually say, what is the ratio of plastic at the surface over plastics in the water column? Um, do, do we know that or can we estimate? I think it depends where you are. So studies in the Elba River, for example, have shown that what's coming out into the marine environment, the vast majority is on the surface. But we know when we go into the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, most of it's fragments, most of it's below the surface. So I think it really depends where you are, the size proportion, how long it's been in the water. There's, there's so many, um, it depends uh, to assign to that. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, that's very interesting. It was a, a good question as well um, from that member of the audience. Okay. Um, We've got uh, some questions for Andre. Um, so some are technical about the sensors and some more about the environment. Um, we'll start with this one. Um, how does the sea state affect the ability to detect oil slick? So is it easier in, you mentioned that the oil sort of dampens the effect of waves. So is it easier in rough or calm waters? And then what about currents that disrupt the sea, sea surface? Does that have an effect? Well, there are conditions for which are optimal for oil spill detection. Uh, the wind speed between 3 and maybe 15 meters per second. And um, if uh, the water is too calm, then you will not be easily see the contrast between oil spill and uh, water surrounded. And if it's very rough sea, it also will be difficult to detect oil spills. So mostly the wind speed is the most important factor. And so also, of, yeah. also oh, there are, as I already mentioned in my presentation, lookalikes that are produced by, for example, algal blooms or wind uh, patterns or upwelling waters etc that may, may look like also dark spots but not oil spills and that's why we use uh, more than dozen dozen of different signatures to discriminate oil spills from lookalikes okay thank you and you've just tackled another question there so i'm <laughs> marking that off because we did have that question about what were the other natural features that look like oil spills so thank you very much for that um I'm just coming back to um, Mikhail now for a question. Um, are the Earth observation products which are used as input data in EU CMAT equally reliable in all water depths? Um, so are they as reliable in the sort of deeper open seas as they are in shallow coastal waters? Um. ask um, other members of the audience to make sure your microphones are muted. Well, thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, well, uh, we use um, EO, uh, observation, uh, EO data products only for shallow waters, so... Um, I think that's not coming from me, right? Okay, it's, it's gone. <laughs> the ship going past with the foghorn on. <laughs> um, 
I'm sorry, you say you're using it mostly in the shallower in water, shallow, yeah, because so, obviously it's the infralittoral. Yeah. And so throughout that depth range, is it equally the the um, the par and the KD par are they equally reliable? Well, uh, we hope so. Um, as I was saying, um, uh, we, we don't have really information um, to um, uh, to assess the reliability of the uh, of the of the product. So this is why I was saying in my conclusion that. Uh, uh, data on uh, the uh, data, um, information on the uncertainty of the of the data product would be um, a good thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think that answers that question then. Um, right. Um, of quite a few people with the same question about atmospheric correction, and I know Lauren, you did say um, a couple of times that this is an area of further research for you in, into the um, you know, the best atmospheric correction to use. Um, but people have asked why was acolyte chosen, um, and how was its quality evaluated um, when producing the indices compared to um, the level two A Sentinel data, which is corrected using the Sen2 core algorithm. Yeah, so uh, we tested a few. We looked at uh, multiple uh, approaches to atmospheric correction. Uh, we did test Sen2 core. It didn't. It didn't do badly actually, because bearing in mind we're not looking for in-water properties. Um, but inevitably, acolytes did very well in the coastal zone. It is designed for high-resolution optical data collected by Sentinel-2 and by Landsat. Um, you have the ability to retrieve surface reflectance and sort of focus more on the Rayleigh scattering, uh, Rayleigh correction. Um, so it worked very well as long as you have at least a very good dark pixel candidate in the scene. Um, in fact, we'd be happy to keep using Acolyte, um, although sometimes it didn't work too well, we did have to have a sort of normalization step afterwards, but um, we'd be happy to keep doing that if we weren't then moving into waters where there are no good dark pixels and we can't rely on that yeah. being a yeah. candidate, uh, especially in the open waters under good light conditions. So. Um, yeah, Acolyte just performed the best. It, it sort of, it didn't over egg things, let's put it that way. It didn't remove too much or, or highlight too much and it just sort of conserved what we were expecting to see in the near infrared and short wave, uh, near infrared and short wave infrared. Thank you. Um, and, and you mentioned you've got publications about this. Is that comparative evaluation included in any of the publications? No, my co-author had already done a comparison with, um, with the, target work that they had because obviously they had drones and then Sentinel-2 and they did the different atmospheric corrections to do the comparison and their recent paper that came out they also chose Acolyte of the two um, so yeah I mean there's, there's still work to be done of course it, it contributes uncertainty but um, yeah it's a whole <laughs> atmospheric correction is a whole field of study on its own which is yeah. which is why I'm trying to tackle it. Okay, as you say, there's uh, so many different what ifs to look at with this isn't there? Yeah, yeah. okay thank you. Um, but I'm going to um, come back to Andre. Well, this is sort of two questions in one. It's what is the format of Sentinel-1 data that you're using? Um, yeah, let's, let's tackle that one first. That was the first part of the question. Okay, we are using the highest resolution data available. Um, we use ground range detection uh, format when the image is uh, translated in the ground range coordinates, uh, VV plus VH uh, polarization. So actually for oil spill detection, we use VV polarization data. Um, the resolution is about uh, 20 by 20 meters for this product. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and then the second part of the question was, um, is the data set used for training open or proprietary? And how are you validating your results? The data set is based on uh, oil spill accidents uh, happened um, over the last. Was it the ITOPF report that you mentioned? Is that the source of data? No, no, no. We no. use our own data set, right. uh, our, prop, our bespoke data set at PML that we collected and identified by visually analyzing uh, Sentinel-1 satellite images. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm staying on the um, Sentinel-1 um, 
theme because we've got a, um, a technical question about this. Of course, um, Sentinel-1 collects on both ascending and descending orbits. How did you manage to mitigate geometrical distortion from the side looking acquisition mode or did you just use all ascending orbits or all descending orbits so you didn't have that issue? Uh, we use SNAP uh, software package to do mapping of satellite images. Um, but actually, well, when when we use uh, the ground range detection product, it's already in ground range coordinates. And um, what we just need is just to map this product into our coordinate system. So it's it's not an issue uh, right, if we okay. work with ascending or descending sensor data. Okay, thank you. Um... Right, I'm going to come back to Lauren now for a question um, about um, the, you've obviously been using your technique for plastic desert detection in quite a few different places around the world with some with more clear waters than others. And I do remember you mentioning that Vietnam had lower accuracy because of high turbidity there. Someone has asked um, if bottom reflectance is an issue um, so interfering with the, the plastic reflectance when you've got shallow clear waters, but then in more turbid waters are suspended particles an issue, which I guess that is what you found in Vietnam. So are these are these both problems or how do you overcome them? Yeah, so for the so when we were getting the perfect pixels of plastic, um, we disregarded that pixel, even though it had a good spectral shape, uh, we just couldn't, uh, you know, we didn't. We wanted to use the most perfect examples possible. So, um, and the, you know, and the, we 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 disregarded it because it wasn't perfect because we were using it for the spectral shape at that stage. And um, turbidity does play a role, of course, which is why we're doing um, the collection of new data outside the Elbe River across water types um, because it's so variable. Like you've got three different types of sediment load in, in the space of 500 meters. And so we're yeah. collecting all that sort of data to understand how the back, because water makes up the big component of the pixel every time, right? So you need to understand the role of turbidity. So that's an excellent question. And it's something that we're gonna be dealing with both in rivers and in highly turbid coastal waters, because we did mainly have success over case one waters, but of course they're the minority in the Northern hemisphere, right? So if we want to extend to global tests, then we have to account for high turbidity as well. So it's a good question. Okay. Well, that might neatly link into um, another question. Um, what would you say are the next steps in expanding this approach to a global level or what, what are the, the key things to overcome, I guess, to achieve that? Yeah, so I mean, uh, one of them. <laughs> yeah, no, at the end of the day, we're leveraging uh, a satellite that wasn't ex exactly designed to do this. So, um, you know, um, there are some, some talks about uh, plastics specific satellites going out there for detection. Um, I would prefer it if we just stop putting plastic in the water in the first place, you know, turn off the tap. Yes. Um, until that happens, um, it, it would be great to have a satellite that sort of does more in the shortwave infrared where we're starting to see a lot of the signal is. But yes, the best we can do at the moment is collect more in-situ data, more validated data, because the bigger your machine learning library, the better the training data, the better your automated process. And then you can start to apply it to all of archival data you know, worldview, um, all of the high resolution optical data. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what I'd like to see because this is a problem that can't be done by what, a single organization or even a single um, sort of country. It's a global issue and it's going to require a lot of a lot of work from a lot of people. Is there any um, kind of you mentioned you had a, a colleague who was pointing towards when um, I think it was South Africa when plastic debris is getting washed up and when is there is there any kind of citizen science initiative so people can report that I mean I know it's not going to be much help out on the open ocean but unless you want a cruise ship no, but coastal no, things there, yeah no there are loads and we're hoping to sort of tap into those more and more I mean social media was key for us to find out where to look for things and on what date like we didn't, we used the literature, of course, but most of the time we found stuff on Instagram or, um, you know, uh, on Twitter where I was like, oh, it's got a date. I know this beach and um, it's in the, you know, it's looking in the coastal zone. Uh, let's see if there's a sentinel image. So, you know, that is social science in a way. Um, and we're tapping into that more and more. 
I just have to step away for one minute. I'm so sorry. I'll be back in a second. No problem. No problem. Thank you very much. And we are actually sort of coming towards the end of um, our question session anyway. So I will um, ask Emily to come back and join us to take us into the break. Um, I think I would also recommend that um, we've got quite a few questions that we're not getting through. We, we will be um, reporting all of these in our workshop write up, but we might see if we can get people to answer them. Um, you know, if, if that's possible, if people will give their, their time for this, um, that we'll be able to then report on this afterwards. So I'm sorry if we haven't got to your question. We'll, we'll see if we can do that another way. Okay, thanks. <gasps> oh, lovely. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of really interesting questions there. So thank you, everyone. And thank you to our speakers. Um, that was fantastic. So we are going to take a short break now, uh, just a 10 minute break. We're going to come back at five to four um, and we're going to have our second set of marine application talks. Um, please remember that you can submit your uh, topic and suggestions for the discussion session tomorrow via meeting pulse. And we'll see you in 10 minutes time. Thank you. <laughs>